It's just strange. Okay, now I can hear everything. I changed, I changed microphone, so welcome to um, tonight's case study class. This is uh, Tuesday, the eighth, nineteenth. Yeah, I think no, today's the eighteenth of uh, June. I'm sorry, February, and uh, we are going to be handling a diverse little agenda here. Um, most of you have responded to my request for individual conferences. If you're having a problem with your schedule and my schedule, we can always do it right before or right after a class. The purpose of the conference is 10 or 15 minutes to keep you on track with the assignment. One of the situations I have found with the online case study class is everybody says, well, I have plenty of time. I don't have to worry about it. And then everybody's asking for extensions. And then the problem is if you're asking for too many extensions, you run out of time in order to take the exam. So I'm being somewhat flexible with when you, how long it takes for the exam uh, for your case study, but I really don't want this thing running, you know, into next July or August. So <clears throat> when we talk, you're supposed to, go to ask questions and get some guidance on the case study. Some of you have not been going to the discussion board. The purpose of the discussion board is to answer questions and build community so that you can see what other people are thinking about. Uh, both uh, we have been responding, or I, I've been trying to respond when I can. I did this afternoon uh, to most of you. And the university uh, is a little bit behind because of scheduling, but we will get all of the information from the textbook up so you'll see all those answers for each of the questions. Are there any questions or concerns regarding the Beetle case or any of the homework assignments that anybody has? I know you may have trouble with the microphones if you want to test them again. If not, feel free to um, send me a chat message. Um, so if anybody has any questions about the Beetle case, send them over. What I do want to remind you is you should have received an email from Dorothy um, with a revision to the Harris case. It's not a large revision. There was something that, we, that was caught that A didn't add up to B on something dealing, I think, with the price of some real estate. So be aware of the fact. Go look at the new case that was either emailed to you or will be on the website as of today. Um, unfortunately, it's not marked revised, but if I, I will send another email. I'm trying to see. I'm almost sure it had to do with the value of some real estate because I think it was raised. So make sure you're using the right Harris case for your project. What I'm going to do is tonight I want to go through, like I did last time, three chapters. Last time I did the cha uh, chapter on uh, cash flow and you said it was beneficial. I'm going to go through three chapters tonight and give you some highlights. Since m most of you have already taken all the classes, I don't want to go through slide by slide. But if you do have questions, email them to me or post them and I will respond to everybody. The other thing is um, regarding the, the chapters, I'm also going to try and record um, chapters seven, which has seven and eight, which have to do with long disability income and long term care, nine for property casualty insurance, and then uh, ten on investment planning, education planning, and retirement planning. So I'm going to try and get some of those up in estate planning in advance uh, or at least the next time. I also want to make sure that you please look at some of the case studies in the textbook. I want to try to have case study 13 as some kind of a discussion with everybody. It's called the case of the good gone bad. It's an ethics case. They do ask ethics questions on the comprehensive exam. I'd really like to try to figure a way to have a conversation. Uh, I'm going to talk to uh, 
somebody in tech support to see if there's a way we can have a conversation even if everybody has to use telephones because I think that would be very beneficial. So be hopefully before the next session I will have gotten at least three or four, seven, eight, nine you know, uh, of the review sessions. That way you also have all the slides. So before I get into tonight's material, are there any questions? Do you think this is a good idea, bad idea? Is, is it something you're finding beneficial or is it a waste of time? So if you can't use the microphone, use the chat room, please. I'm going to give you a second to gather your thoughts. Okay, one person, Susan, thank you. It's been very helpful. Good. Um, the other reason I'm thinking of doing them so that if they're in an archive, you can access them when you need to. Danielle or Zach, any input? Danielle agrees. Okay. Then I will send emails when I get them done. I have to figure out a way to get this taken care of, but I'll do that. So let me, and I again, I am not going to go through every one of these slides because, well, let me, let me ask you this. I don't remember because everyone was not necessarily one of my classes. Is there anybody challenging the exam where they didn't take all the classes that's out of the three of you that are in the classroom tonight? Nope. Can you hear me? Oh, I can hear you now perfectly. Thank you. Cool. No. Okay. Can you hear me as well? Is that Danielle? Yeah. Great. I can hear you too. And I know, Susan, uh, you don't have a microphone, but don't worry about it. Another question, is the, do you have anything up on the screen right now or is it supposed to be blank? No, I have something on the screen, I have an outline on the screen of what I'm talking about, but it, well, let me try this. Hold on a second. Yeah, it's not I'm going to put a slide up. Okay, is there a slide up now that says learning objectives? No. Yes. Can everybody see learning objectives? Zach, uh, Zach said yes, I, Danielle? I, no, I can't see it. Um, I mean, maybe I should try to, I might try to like re-log back in. Okay, I'm going to talk for a minute. Let me know when you get back in the room. Okay. 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 Uh, while I'm waiting for Danielle to re-log in, uh, my question is, is, if anybody has a question or something you want me to make sure I cover, let me know. I can see it now. Okay, perfect. Okay, here's what I want to do. Um, as I said, I am going to go through some of, I'm not going to go through every slide, but all the slides will now be, and the slides from session two, yes, they all should have been posted. If they're not, send me an email and I'll check on it tomorrow. Susan, is that okay? Everything should be in the archive already. If not, I want to know about it. Thank you. Okay. The purpose of the, doing this case study is to try to synthesize and bring together all of the different disciplines you should have been familiar with from the courses. So tax planning is a big one and it's highly tested. As I've said before on the comprehensive exam, they are going to ask phase in and phase out questions of when Roth IRAs, when you can deduct an IRA, when you can um, qualify for different benefits um, such as maybe student loans. They may ask a question that asks you what is the uh, full retirement age for Social Security assuming you were born in, in, in this year or assuming you're 35 years of age. They may ask you a question regarding um, how much money you can put in to a 401k, 403b if you're under 50, over 50. Or in a health savings account, at what age can you put in more money? And it's, and that, you know, the extra catch-up, it's not 50, it's age 55. So when we're talking about tax planning, we're not expecting you to become an enrolled agent or a CPA unless you are one. But you do need to have some basic understanding of the tax law. And you do need to understand the difference between income tax, capital gains tax, gift tax, estate tax, and so forth. 
The basic 10-step income tax formula is listed here. What's the gross income? What are your non-taxable items? Calculate the, the, uh, your gross income. Subtract expenses to come up with AGI. Reduce the AGI either by your itemized or your standard deductions. We take off your personal exemptions and those of others. Calculate your liability. Reduce your taxes if you can through other credits. And then uh, these are the basic steps. Again, you're not expected to become a tax expert, but some of the things you do need to be aware of. Um, it talks about the quant to quantify the client's income tax need planning needs. Everybody is not a $5 million or $10 million net worth person. Different people have different needs. People at different stages of life will have different needs. It's your job as a planner to be able to give them certain tips. And it says, what are your attitudes? What are your beliefs and behaviors? One of the things I will tell you is I personally had and worked with people who said, I don't want to ever use municipal bonds because I think, you know, because it's advantageous to me, it's wrong. I've also talked to people and I've decided I didn't want them as clients who would say, I'm willing to do anything I can to avoid paying income tax. And I will always qualify it. I say, well, define anything you can. And if, if I feel they're pushing that envelope too far, I don't want to have them as a client because I don't want to put myself in that position where I might be uh, doing something illegal or having to keep quiet about somebody trying to do things illegal. Make sure you pay attention as a planner to household in situations and the changes that occur, especially when we're talking of marital changes or the critical ages of taxpayers as they get older and think about retirement and think about the um, for retirement age for Social Security. What about inheritance? I never count, as I said last time, anybody inheriting money, winning the lottery, or getting a huge bonus until it occurs. But I do want to know about it. What about the fact that sometimes people have children, grandchildren, or they may be responsible for other relatives, even adult relatives. We have to be aware of all these things. Be aware of the fact that you have both pre and post tax filing information and they change and the tax laws do change frequently. If you remember in 2012, somewhere between the 15th and of December and the in Christmas or right after Christmas, Congress finally decided to do some things with the tax law and all of a sudden it ended up meaning that the IRS didn't even have enough time to develop the required paperwork and get it out on time. So things were pushed back but that didn't necessarily mean that the filing dates were pushed back. Please be aware of the fact, where does taxable income come from? It's not always salaries. It could be earned income if people are self-employed. It can be pensions and royalties, and certain things are taxed differently, and it's your responsibility to at least have an understanding of passive income versus active income, passive losses versus active losses. How, does capital, how are capital gains calculated depending on the marginal tax bracket? What does marginal tax bracket really, really mean? Well, if you're in the maximum tax bracket, remember that's only for those dollars over a certain number. It's not for every dollar you earn. What about people that are gamblers? Is it their profession or is it just a hobby? What about commissions? And remember, people in service industries that frequently get tips, the IRS has figured out what percentage is for waiters and waitresses there should be claiming. Please make sure you review under employee benefits what Section 79 means, what Section 79 income means, how that affects someone's life insurance, disability income insurance, and so forth, because it may have a tax ramification when the benefit is received, or it may not, depending on how things are reported. Remember, you also need to understand what self-employment income means. If I'm going too fast, please make sure you let me know. Capital gains. Remember, it says managing capital gains and losses is very important. Only $3,000 of net capital losses can be used in any one year to reduce your taxable income. However, that's if you don't have gains to offset losses. If you have $35,000 worth of gains, you can offset $35,000 worth of losses. But if you don't have those gains, then you can only 
take the losses to the extent of three thousand dollars. Danielle, I see you just came back in. I hope everything's okay. Hobbies and businesses. Please pay attention that when people have hobbies, if they turn it into a business or, or whatever, you have to know how to keep those books and records and realize that you, you know, people have businesses not just to take off write-offs, but they want to ultimately make profits. ANT, alternative minimum tax, is a huge deal. When it first started, it was supposed to be for people that had large incomes that they had to pay a certain amount of income tax. Unfortunately, the IRS and Congress never indexed this, so now a lot of people that it was never intended to cover are under alternative minimum tax, and they have to know how to figure it out. So be aware of that tax liability and what covers that tax liability, and especially today if you have high income earners that uh, are over $425,000 for a family, you have to be aware of how that ties in with the extra surtax for Medicare as well as the alternative minimum tax. I will tell you, work with people's accountants to determine their tax liability. That doesn't mean you might not want to look at a program if you have one and just give them a guess, but I would never, ever be the definitive uh, tax person for unless that's what I'm doing. If I'm not a tax preparer, I don't want that responsibility. Uh, Danielle, I don't know what's wrong with the slides that they're not moving for you. Um, I, am, uh, I am now on slide 18 of 35. Do, that, do you see that slide? 18 of 35, documents and evaluate current tax planning situation. I don't know, it just keeps getting stuck on one slide and then like I know you're talking about something else, but like right now I left and came back and now it's stuck on the capital gain slide and it hasn't moved. So mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure what's wrong with, with my uh, system right now. Do you want to come back in one more time and try it? I'll wait a second. Okay, well, I'll try one more time. One more time. Okay, so I'm just going to go over a couple things. Um, when you're talking to your clients, remember, especially for the comprehensive exam, you're looking at three years back taxes. I frequently talk and get permission to talk to their accountants, even if the accountant's the one who introduced me or I introduced the client to the accountant. I want to make sure they're comfortable with us communicating. And I want to make sure that I don't do the accountant's job. I will frequently defer to the accountant. If I think that there's a situation that there's some items that the accountant should be aware of or might have missed, I will call the accountant quietly, not with, with the client, because I never want to embarrass the accountant. It's not a good way to win friends and influence people. Um, Danielle? I see you're back in the room. I'm going to move to slide number 19. Tell me if you can see it now. Tax adjusted returns. No, it didn't. It didn't move. So it must just be, uh, I don't know, probably because I'm on my iPad. I don't know why it's not working tonight. So. Okay. Um, are, you, are you using Safari or using another browser? I have, I have like the Collaborate app. No, what, 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 what browser are you using? There is, no, there is no browser. Um, Dorothy sends me the URL and then I sign into the app. Okay. Because I'm on an iPad. I'm not on an actual computer okay. right then now. Then I, I don't know what to do, but, but I... Yeah. I don't know what's I'm wrong sorry. with it tonight, but okay. that's okay. You okay. Can I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to at least identify what slide I'm on so you can look at it. Remember to pay attention to the marginal tax rate because it's showing you the formula to figure out on the difference in municipal bonds, if you're in a 4% uh, interest bond, would need um, a 5.33% equivalent interest. That's something that also might get tested on the exam under the investment side. I'm moving over to slide number uh, 20, which is just talking about other tax planning tips. Um, I'm not going to go through the slides with these. There, I'm now on slide 24. 
you have to pay attention to when it makes sense to convert from a taxable instrument to a non-taxable instrument and consider what a Roth means versus a traditional and who's, who would you recommend for one. Does everyone need the upfront tax advantage or are they better off paying the taxes now and never having to worry about RMD or taxes later? Should everyone at the age of 60 convert and pay the taxes up front? Those are situations that you should be discussing. Regarding 529 plans, uniform gift to minors or trust to minors accounts for college, saving taxes, these are things you'll be discussing as well as on your case study. Um, I'm now going to move over to slide number uh, 28. This is a formula for the equivalent taxable rate of return of basically for municipal bonds. It's also in the investment course, but slide number 28, in case you want to review it, it's also in your textbook. What about mortgage interest? Be aware of how much mortgage interest you are allowed to deduct. Be aware of how much home equity interest you're allowed to deduct. Are you allowed to deduct interest on six mortgages or on one? What about this, the primary mortgage uh, Federal income tax is only on the first million dollars used to acquire, build, and improve the residence. So be aware of how that is worked in because they can ask a question which would definitely drive you crazy. I'm skipping over these slides 29, 30, 31. Um, qualifying dependent exemption, there's five tests to figure out what makes the most sense for a client. Um, who's who's going to get the exemption? Client's tax return from previous one, two, and possibly three years provides solid starting points for developing tax planning strategies and some caution for the future. I will tell you that the 1040 form will also give you ideas of how they invest, where their money is, how to look for money, what their philosophy is about charitable deductions, as well as what the philosophy is about the kind of investments they have. So I use it as a guide of where they have money and many times I find that as much as I think, first of all, I never assume I have any fault of anybody's money, but as much as I think I know where they have money, using as a financial planning tool their tax form is a great planning tool. And then this last slide, number 35 or 35, gives you some more hint of what you should be looking for and what lines to look at in terms of moving expenses. Um, you know, are they maximizing their employer pre-tax benefits? I will also tell you if you're doing a financial plan, you may want to request that you look at the client's um, overall employee benefit book if, if they have it available because you might find employee benefits they didn't know they had that are valuable for them to be aware of. Uh, how many dependents are they claiming? If they're divorced, who's claiming the dependent? Do they change it from year to year? They both can't claim the same dependent in the same year. So this is just some highlights. It's taken about 15 or 20 minutes. Um, before I move on to Chapter 5, are there any questions? We're all good over here. Say it one more time, Zach. You're okay? Yep, good. Danielle, you okay? I'm sorry you can't find things. Okay. No, that's fine. Um, I understand everything, but I'll go back and look at the slides on the black, or um, okay. whatever the online thing. I'm going to make sure that everything should be up there because it is being recorded. Okay, I am now under Chapter 5 and I'm the Life Insurance Basics. I believe all of you had me as an instructor, so we spent a lot of time on this. And if you remember, I gave you that uh, Life Insurance 101 where we talked about the one cent, three cent, five cent plan and so forth. Uh, that's still a good summary of life insurance. When we're talking about life insurance, for the comprehensive exam, be aware of the fact, and for the case study, please be aware of the fact that you need to understand what life insurance is, what's the right kind of product for the situation, the right product, Are they, do they need a lot of life insurance temporarily for loans, for college, 
for a young family? Are they looking to maximize retirement savings? Where are they at? When, how are they going to be planning? Um, it's as much an emotional decision as anything else. And if you remember in my class, I asked questions like, what is it about money that's important to you? Because it helps people crystallize what their needs are. Um, be aware that when you're talking of life insurance, in my belief, in many advisors' beliefs, the breadwinners are the most important people to insure. But with funerals in the Chicago area and many areas around the country running at, oh, ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000, a lot of people want to have basic insurance to cover their loved ones because everyone doesn't have that kind of money. And I think I gave you the example in class of when the tragedy occurred in Chicago and the porch collapsed and 13 young people died, a family in one of the most affluent school districts and zip codes in the country because of marital issues and income issues didn't have enough money to bury one of their children and the community did put together a fund. But that highlights the fact that you can't prejudge people based upon um, where they stand. Uh, I didn't mean to go that fast. When we're talking about clients, understand that you're going to underwriting. Underwriting is an important thing to look at. We have to be aware of how it works. And the keys for underwriting for someone happens to be to make sure you understand are they smokers or non-smokers. Smokers will probably pay 30% more for, for life insurance. A 50-year-old smoker will probably be paying the premium of someone around the age of 64, 65, a non-smoker. Are there people that have had situations where they drink a lot? Have they used drugs? Have they, do they, are they reckless drivers? And that doesn't necessarily mean DUIs. Are they in hazardous occupations? And today, invasive surgery by doctors is sometimes classified as hazardous. Not always. Uh, is there any family history of situations? Uh, what is their income situation? What is their personal um, hobbies? You know, if, if they believe in going cave exploring or jumping out of airplanes, that's going to have an impact on what their premiums will be. Have they ever had insurance denied because of health or any other situations? You have to determine the needs of the client. And in the class number one, when we talked about insurance, we talked about needs analysis, human life value, and even using capital, um, capitalization of a number to help you determine the life insurance. The two that are probably going to be tested the most would be human life value and needs analysis. And just make sure you review what those are before the comprehensive. Um, again, I'm ignoring these slides here. How much life insurance does a client need? Well, what do they need to pay their bills? How much income do they need for the family? How much debt do they have? Regardless of the, may, the way you're going to be doing the analysis, you're going to not be far off. The question is, do you want to eat up the capital or do you want to leave the capital alone? But whether, whatever approach you're using will be okay. And remember, human life value, human life value is a trick if you, don't, if you forget, it's the amount of money you're earning as a money machine during your income-producing years. It's not during your rest of your life expectancy until the day you pass away. If you, they're going to target retirement. They're going to say, assuming you make X amount of dollars uh, to retirement, what is your human life value if you're 35 years old and they're using full retirement age? They're going to tell you what they're looking for. I am not going through this calculator. You can do that on your own if you so desire. I'm now moving over to slide number 16. Social Security. Remember that people that are fully insured and review the Social Security rules for, for fully insured, partially insured, uh, full retirement age. Remember that under fully insured, Social Security is eligible to have his or her surviving spouse and sometimes children receive a lump sum death benefit of $255. Now, $255 in 1936 would pay for a funeral. 
$255 in 2014, I'm not sure, pays for an obituary in the Sun-Times or Tribune, but they've never raised that amount. And when you're talking to clients, I'm not telling you to be an insurance salesperson. I don't care if you love insurance or hate insurance. What I am telling you is it's a risk management tool, a risk management tool as part of the financial planning process. Slide number 18 explains human life value and how to compute it. And it's also in the textbook. What it's saying is, what are we as a money machine from the time we're working to the time we're going to retire? And what do we need for our income? And you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure this out. The capital retention approach says based continuing stream of income from life insurance benefits and current income. So what this is going to say is they're going to be depleting the asset. They're going to basically annuitize the insurance. Income retention, you don't have to memorize any of these formulas. You have to understand the concept. To the best of my knowledge, they don't ask test questions saying, can we compute this? If, if they all of a sudden start doing that, I'm sorry, but they haven't been doing it in the past. But remember, on uh, needs analysis, the income retention or whatever it says here, how much you're going to get from Social Security. Annuities. Well, please be aware that this is going to give you a formula. With you. With my, my belief is one of the common adjustments to the change of the formula is the beginning versus the end of the year when the payment is going to be due. Of whether it's an ordinary annuity or annuity due, go back and review the time value of money calculations. Oops, just did something wrong here. Skip the slide. I'm now on slide number 23. The income multiplier approach. From uh, what, in all honesty, most people, most insurance companies today will allow most people to purchase. 20 to 30 times their annual income for life insurance. Because once they have that amount of income, you can invest it 20 to 30 times. Some companies will say 20, some may say as much as 30. They also may index it, or not index it, but they also may uh, look at it based upon what your total income is and what other insurance you have. I'm on slide. Whoops. I don't know what just happened. But I got a. It says for a planning tip, try to use their income, living expenses. Now I'm going to I'm going to take a quick second here, and I'm going to tell you that it, I'm going to repeat what I said in the class class number one. If someone says to me, "Can you give me a rough idea of how much life insurance I need?" I've been talking to X, I've been talking to Y, I don't know what I need. My first question is, "How much debt do you have?" your mortgage, your car payments, your credit card, your student loans, whatever, and uh, health payments or health loans. And somebody will say, student loans, but I thought if I had student loans, they're paid off. Well, yeah, but for my purposes, here's the question. I have Jack and Jill. If one of them dies and they have a loan that's through the FAFSA form in the federal government, that's already built in with an insurance policy. That's paid off. But what about Jack and Jill, do you want to make sure that your surviving spouse's loan is paid off at the same time so that you don't have to worry about it? Almost everybody says yes. Almost everybody says yes. Do you want to pay off your mortgage or do you want to have the right to pay off your mortgage? Well, what do you mean? If interest rates, if your mortgage is at 4% and you can invest at 7%, do you want to invest the money and keep the mortgage or do you want to pay it off? Conversely, if you're investing, if your mortgage is at seven percent, the best you can earn money is at four. And I explain how that works. Usually, people want the flexibility. And if, so, if they want the flexibility and they want this, all the loans, I just take a round number and say, um, you know, if you want the loan, you want everything else. Let's just assume Sally has. 30 or 40 or 50,000, you have 30 or 40, 50,000, we'll just build that into the model. But then, after I find out how much debt they have, 
and let's assume the total amount of debt, including the mortgage and everything else, is $400,000. I know I need $400,000 of capital. And then I say, Jack, how much do you make? Gross. And whatever number he gives me, I then say, okay, let's assume 30% of that is for taxes, Social Security, and the money you're putting into your 401k. Sometimes it's more, and they tell me. Then I say, let's assume 15% of that amount is for your personal expenses. And I explain what I mean by that. Your clothes, your car, your spending money, your ball games, whatever you want. So let's assume they start with 100,000. I'm doing it so we can do this together. They start with 100,000 of income. I take 30,000 off for taxes. I take another $15,000 off for personal expenses. Now I'm down to, well, 100,000 minus 30 is 70,000 minus 15 is 55,000. How much, income, how much capital do we need in order to generate $55,000 of income if we can invest the money in U.S. government bonds and they're currently at, say, 3%? Now, I'm going to help you out here. A million dollars of capital at 3% will generate $30,000 of income. So, if I need $55,000, it's real simple for me to do the math. I add in the amount of money on the uh, debt, and I can basically, on the side of a napkin in three minutes, tell them how much life insurance they need as an estimate. Not the right kind, but at least I can let them have an idea of how much insurance they need. Now, for the exam, unless they say using capitalization of a number, use human life value or needs analysis. But I'm giving you a shorthand for, that might help you. Um, and remember, they may ask how much additional insurance you need. I'm on slide number 26 of 50. Additional insurance you need. And it says, what's the net additional? So that would include how much insurance you currently have, how much you have at work, how much you have personally. It may say, it say including your other assets. So you, then you'd include your retirement accounts, your other investment accounts. Let's assume hypothetically, you need $2.5 million of capital or insurance. And you have $400,000 already, and you have another $500,000 in your retirement accounts. Well, then you don't need $2.5 million. You need the net difference. And remember, please read the question carefully so you can figure out what you really, really need. If I'm going too fast, let me know. This is just supposed to be an overview. If we're talking about the second step and it says, does your employer cover any have any insurance? Are you eligible for? Don't always assume that the employer group plan is cheaper than what someone can get on their own. If someone is in really good health, the best preferred rate for term insurance is probably going to be cheaper than what they could get through their employer's plan if they were going to go through underwriting. I am going to tell you, to the best of my knowledge, all of these formulas on figuring out how much it, the insurance would cost and what the cost analysis is and the yearly payment per, um, per thousand should be, the benchmarks, to the best of my knowledge, this isn't going to be tested. You're not going to be asked to compute this or worry about it. I wouldn't worry about it. I have never used it. Number one, computers do it for me. And number two, I don't want to get involved with all this math. It's not going to happen on your exam. I have not seen it on any sample test questions, and I have not seen it on any sample exams. It does say determine the net amount and everything else. Um, slide number 34. Policy should only be canceled upon terminate, the termination of whatever provisions you have and making sure you have the current insurance in place that you really need. Too many people make the mistake of canceling insurance before they should. Please go back and review non-forfeiture and dividend options so you understand that. Non-forfeiture options are for permanent cash value policies that say, you've been paying money into it for a long period of time, you want to stop paying, you want to reduce your payment, you want to do something else, how do you do that? And there's two slides, 35 and 36, that explain it. Or 34 and 35, I should say. Wait a minute. 
Now, I'm on slide 37. Slide 37 is a chart you should become familiar with. A chart like this was on my comprehensive exam. So let me explain how to read it. The chart says end of policy year, end of policy year, and it says 1 through 20, 860, 865. Cash or loan value is in column two. That is per thousand dollars of insurance. Cash or loan value per thousand dollars of insurance. Paid up insurance or reduced paid up insurance. Again, that is per thousand dollars of insurance. So, the, and then the final two columns say extended term, years and days. Now, I'm going to go down to year 10 and I'm going to explain how to read this. I'm on slide 37, I'm sorry, it's slide, slide 36. Now, and it's a, it looks like an Excel spreadsheet. Year 10 says cash or loan value is $1,719. If you have a $10,000 policy, you multiply it by 10, because you have $10,000 units, that becomes $1,719. If you have a $50,000 policy, you multiply it by 50, and that would obviously become um, $1,719 times 50. I don't have a calculator in front of me. I'm sorry. That would tell you how much cash you have in the contract at the end of the 10th year if you wish to cancel the policy. There may be a tax consequence depending on the basis of the contract. The next slide a line over says paid up insurance or reduced paid up insurance and for the 10th year it says 3690 again you'd multiply that by the number of insurance units thousand dollars per unit so at 10 units for ten thousand dollars you'd have thirty six thousand nine hundred dollars of reduced paid up insurance if you never want to make another premium payment that's what you have is If you never want to make another premium payment, that's what you have, $36,900. The next two columns say extended term. If you don't want to take the cash and you don't want the reduced paid up, but you want to maintain your policy as a term contract, for the, and again, I'm in year, line 10 for 10th year, the term contract would last 19 years, 78 days. Once you learn how to read it, you're going to answer one question very easily because all you got to remember is how many units of insurance are there. Now, I just want to take a deep breath and, and give you a second in case anybody has a question. This was on my comprehensive exam. I recently asked someone if they had something like this on theirs, and I was told yes. So I want to make sure you understand it while I'm going through it. Okay, no questions. I'm going to move over to slide number 38. Review the, re the revenue ruling, revenue code 1035 exchange, which is like kind endowment. I'm sorry, like kind exchange, where you can go from a life insurance contract to a life insurance contract. You can go from a life insurance contract to an annuity. You can go from an annuity to annuity, but you can't go from an annuity to a life insurance contract because it changes the taxation and when the IRS gets paid. Remember, if you're doing this, it has to be same insured same owner when you make the transfer. And there's very specific rules to make sure you do it. I'm now flipping over to slide number 39, annuities. Annuities are important in the financial planning process, especially for income purposes and especially for retirement income. We have deferred annuities that can be fixed or variable. We have immediate annuities that can be fixed or variable. We have joint and survivor annuities, which can be for the husband and wife. Uh, under fixed annuities, we also have CD annuities and or uh, indexed annuities. Um, and in today's world, we also have some hybrid products, but I don't think that's going to be tested, at least not yet. Uh, I'm moving over to slide 43. Um, Remember to pay attention what the basis is for life insurance. Remember to understand what a biatical settlement or a accelerated death benefit is. 
a couple of exams ago, there were five questions on modified endowment contracts. We view that. That's where it's become an investment because over the first seven years you put too much cash in the policy. Please understand what waiver of premium means. Please understand what uh, the death benefit on an annuity means and how that's taxed. It's taxed differently than a life insurance contract. On a life insurance contract, uh, the death benefit paid to a named beneficiary is never taxed. On a annuity, unless it's a spouse, there will be tax. The spouse can defer the tax. I'm on now on slide 47. It highlights one to use a cash value policy as opposed to a term because it has some savings vehicle, uh, items for you. Please be aware of the fact that with cash value insurance, some people like it, some people don't. Some people think it's wrong. Other people think it's a great way to help accumulate money. If you're talking to a, taking a test question and it says that you're a um, entrepreneur or a risk taker and you max out your 401k, maybe the right product for a retirement account for the exam would be to use a variable universal life contract. Remember to pay attention to the difference between estate tax, gift tax, income tax, capital gains tax. Remember to review what the basis means for insurance. Figure out when you want to use term insurance. As I said, if you need a large amount of insurance for loans or to help take care of a young family. Now, I've just gone through in 20 minutes a great deal of information about life insurance. And I, and, and I want to know if you need me to review anything. Again, if you don't have an answer right now, I'll be more than happy to get an email and review it again in the next session. And again, I am going to put up, I'm going to try to put up a couple more uh, sessions of these slides so that it's in the archive before next week. Next week we will not have a class. Everyone's good. Danielle, you okay? Yep. Uh, Susan, okay. I'm going to flip over now and go through health insurance. And I also have to tell you, um, I don't know what the new health insurance plan is going to be under the Affordable Care Act. Nobody knows because they keep changing it. I don't want to get into the politics of it. I don't want to say it's good, bad, or indifferent. I want you to be aware that when you go to take the comprehensive exam, if you're taking review class, you may want to ask somebody what, is, what, what you're expected to know. I can't figure out what you should know at this moment. Health insurance is one of the most widely used insurance forms. It's something that's very controversial in some regards because people complain about pre-existing conditions not being covered. They complain about how much the premium is, especially today. They're complaining about how the claims are paid. Be aware of the fact that for all of the bad sides, if you have a big claim, it can bankrupt you without insurance. A member of my family recently had claims in excess of $500,000. In excess of $500,000. And I'm not talking about a one-year stay in a hospital. Um, be aware of the fact that under the new laws, and there are some slides here that will explain it, they're talking about um, a lot on pre-existing condition, a lot on cost containment, and so forth. When you're figuring out what a client needs for insurance, obviously you want no limits on, or caps on the amount of coverage. Under the new Affordable Care Act, caps are going away. Under the Affordable Care Act, pre-existing conditions is set up if, if the policy follows the guidelines, won't matter. However, premiums are going higher, out-of-pocket maximums are there, deductibles are higher because, again, the insurance industry isn't going to go broke trying to pay claims. And what's happened is you have lots of people that never had insurance that now have to have insurance. It says here there's an opt-out question. If both parents provide family coverage and the parent whose birthday comes first in the year is the primary provider, be aware of the fact that if Jack and Jill have both had policies at work, they both don't need the insurance. Maybe 
in one case, they both want to have it from work because it might be free without having any benefits, and they may determine who has the better plan for their children, and you may have to help them with that. Be aware of the fact that COBRA is something that's going to be tested, the Consolidated Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act. And be aware, I don't know how they're going to test it. They could ask the basics, which has to do with COBRA for standard COBRA if you have a company with more than 20 employees. And right now, it looks like it's going to be 20 employee units because some people are being down, or, uh, downsized 39 hours. So if they have 20 or more employees, they have to be covered under COBRA. What happens if the company, uh, somebody is sending me a text message, the connection is freezing up. What connection? I don't know who sent that to me. Is that Susan? Susan, are, are we having a problem with the connection? Susan, if you're having a problem with the connection, Go out of the system, come back in, I'll wait a minute. I'm going to talk about a couple of things, okay? Zach, are you still there? I am here. Danielle, are you still around? I'm here. Good. Um, I'm, going to I, I, I'm going to repeat this because to me it's important because it happened to a couple of my clients. They were going to be covered under COBRA and their company went out of business. In one case, one of these guys was the last guy terminated from the company, and the company closed their doors. If there is no company, there is no COBRA. And during the financial crisis of 2007, 8, 9, lots of people found out the hard way that they had no coverage. Lots of people found out they had no coverage because the plan, the underlying company left. So for COBRA, you have to remember uh, a couple things. Number one, who's covered? For most people, it's 18 months after you terminate unless you're fired for doing something illegal, 18 months from termination. Then you have to determine what was the triggering event. Was it retirement? Was it death? Was it disability? Because if it was disability, you have 18 months plus 11 months. If it was death, you're over the age of 55, you have a child who was covered under your plan um, that might be disabled, it might be 36 months of coverage. And then the other question is, how much can the company charge you? They're allowed to charge 102% of the unsubsidized premium. 102% of the unsubsidized premium. I'm still waiting for Susan to get back in the room. Wait another minute or two. Um, COBRA is for companies with more than 20 employees. Be aware of the fact that if your company has less than 20 employees and you're in the state of Illinois, there is a health insurance continuation plan that will give you up to 12 months of coverage, again, for the unsubsidized premium. Also be aware of the fact that um, COBRA is not always cheaper than an individual plan if you're in really good health, but it's automatic. Um, sometimes COBRA would be for the child going to college, uh, but most universities now have their own plan if they want to get on it. Um, I don't see Susan coming back in the room, so I'm not going to wait any longer. She'll probably pick it up on the recording. Retirees. Retirees, it's very important that you talk to your clients about Medicare planning. Remember the difference between Medicare and Medicaid. Medicaid is for the indigent. It's public aid. Medicare is health insurance primarily for retired people with a few exceptions. And Medicaid and Medicare under the Affordable Care Act, uh, it looks like especially Medicaid is going to be expanded. Be aware of Medicare Part A, which is automatic at age 65. Part B, which you pay for at age 65 when you enroll. Part C, which would be Medicare um, uh, 
like a, a, an HMO. Part D is for drugs. Remember, pay attention to the tax ramifications if you're self-employed and if you need to get health insurance and what you're allowed to deduct if you're not a corporation. You want to see, I think they get charts. Um, these charts you can, don't show up very well, but they're in the textbook uh, on PPOs and point of service. Again, I went over that when, I, when you were in my class, same information. Uh, slide number 16 discusses in more detail the Part A, Part B, Part C, slide 16 through 20. Remember, you want to tell your clients about getting Medicare supplement or Medigap insurance to supplement that which the current plan doesn't hit your, the blue, uh, Medicare plans don't cover. It says document current coverage. So as part of your financial planning process, you should review what they have and be able to explain it to them. The best way I would do it is ask them if they understand it. Ask them to look at their employee benefit book because people don't understand what they don't know. Ask them what are the exclusions. I'm now going over to slide number um, 26. Keep in mind that no matter what kind of choices you have, sometimes if it's through the employer, they're limited. You don't have full choices. And sometimes you have to change your doctor as the plans change. Uh, one year, all of a sudden, my wife was a teacher. We got a letter that the doctor we've been going to for eight years was no longer in the new plan. We had to change doctors. About two and a half years later, the doctor we changed to wasn't in the plan, and the doctor we were with originally was back in the plan. Don't ask me why. Um, Slides 30 through 33 break down a lot of the changes in the Affordable Care Act and health insurance and what's been going on. So in 2010, young, ad young adults would be covered up to age 16. Um, in 2010, uh, companies were prohibited from denying, cover denying coverage to children under the age of 19 because of medical issues. And in some cases, insurance companies stopped writing children. Um, women can receive treatment in 2010 um, from a network OBGYN without first obtaining pre-authorization. Actually, the state of Illinois had that well before 2010. Slide 31, uh, women can receive treatment from a network, uh, sorry, 2010 to 2014, lifetime and annual benefits were going to be increased. Uh, where these restrictions would be taken away. Uh, 2013, uh, different thresholds came into being. A spending account uh, thresholds will be limited to $2,500 per year okay, and then adjusted for uh, cost of living. 2014, most people would be covered, but again, they've expanded, they've been expanding that by executive order. Uh, I'm on slide 32. Uh, what about beneficiaries for coinsurance? In 2014, employers with more than 50 full-time employees that do not offer coverage are going to be fined. So all of this is here on a summary, and I may try to put up some slides I have for my other class as a supplement for you when I review a couple of things under health insurance. Um, 2018, there's going to be an excise tax of 40% on Cadillac plans. So people where the premiums are too high, you're going to have to pay ordinary income tax on that extra coverage. On 2014, um, HSAs, uh, limited annual cost sharing to the high deductible plan, the law qualified for high deductibles would go from uh, 2,000 for individuals to 4,000 for families. I'm now on slide 30, uh, I think I'm done. Yeah, I finished all the slides. So you said you found this helpful. I am going to try to record a couple more of these chapters and put them in the archive. You'll get an email. If you have any questions, let me know. When we talk individually, you need to tell me how you're doing on your individual cases. And we need to have a game plan so you get the project done. 
the project is to be done using Word, PowerPoint, Excel, without a pre uh, software package, a pre available software package. And a lot of people are finding it very time consuming. I'm talking 30, 40, 50 hours to put this together. So I want you to be aware of what it is, and then you will make a presentation. The presentation can be done in person or over the internet. And I'll discuss that with each of you when the time comes. Um, I believe, Danielle, I don't remember if we have a time set up for our next conversation. No, I haven't, up yet? I haven't set anything up yet for a second one. Okay, we need to do that, so send me an email with some times. If you want to do it in person or over the phone, I don't care. Uh, I need 10 or 15 minutes of your time, but you need to tell me where you're at and if you have any questions on the Harris case. Okay, yeah. Or any of the other work. Okay? Yeah, I'll email you. Okay, I'm going to turn off the recording and end this session uh, right now. It's 6.35. We've been talking for about an hour.